Tevo Sun, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for making the time and uh, giving me your support on my second solo effort. It's been four years in the making, a lot of uh, research and uh, a lot of um, fact finding. And um, through the process of writing this book, I, I realized that I could either turn out a book that was really factual and statistical and something that will bore you to death, or I could turn those fa facts and statistics into something entertaining. And that was the challenge, to write this book in the, in the kind of form that I usually teach in, which is to entertain. I believe that the best way to educate someone is to entertain someone. So, if you find this book great, and I think you will, please recommend it to your friends. It's not just for trading or investing, it's not just for business, but it's also good for your own personal lives. A lot of the things that I've written in here will stand in good stead when it comes to your own personal financial management. Let me talk about how the, the, the whole idea came about. It's all about trading. It all starts with trading first, and then you'll appreciate why it's such a, a totally encompassing subject, right? Trading as we know it, back in the old days, was a very personal thing. There were no markets to speak of. If you were a trader, you were, a, you were probably a merchant running a business and you'd be selling your wares on a personal basis, face to face, and we'd be trading against the competition who's just across the street and we'll offer a better price for that. And that was trading in the old days. And prices moved because of that kind of trading, the competition, and, and one uh, merchant wanting to outbid the other merchant. Now, this was a bit haphazard, there was no organization, but things evolved. Eventually, trading was taken to the next level, where we didn't have to have a shop. We would send a representative to a place to actually bid for those prices. That became the first established market. You didn't see any produce there, right? no products there, and they were just traders. These traders were literally bartering and screaming out prices and trading. It was rather haphazard, as you can see, and uh, it went to the next level. It got a bit more organized. Yeah? And at this point in time, the more organized it got, the irony is, the more manipulated it got. People started colluding, arrange, fixing prices, and then, you know, as a, as, a, as a group of conglomerates, we would call them to market and we'll probably get all the orders and then the other smaller players get left on the side. So manipulation in the market is, is not new. It's, it's very old. And manipulation became even worse when it became even more organized. So it would seem like, you know, going back to the old days when we were just bartering across the street would be a much better way to, to trade, right? There was not much manipulation then. Well, this is what we know as trading in the modern market. But this was still very backward. We didn't have communication like what we have today. Uh, they didn't even have like decent phone lines and stuff like that. So we moved to the next level of trading where communication came into play, right? Orders moved faster and because of that, manipulation became even worse. There were run on, runs on the bank because of price manipulations. People had little faith in the market system, and failed ever so often, and this brought about some sort of regulation. Exchanges became regulated and prices were regulated. And this was the very first machine to regulate those prices. This was known as the ticker tape machine, where, well, as you can see, the tape comes out with prices on it and everybody gets the same price. And then we'll be bidding on that price. So there was some organization now. But humans being humans, they were able to manipulate those prices. They were able to fix prices, monopolize, corner markets. And uh, the manipulation just keeps getting worse. During this period, right, as we move into the modern era, we have electronics, right? We have communication, modern communication as we know it. And with the advancement of technology, manipulation also gets more advanced. Things get more twisted. You get people who will lie, steal, cheat. They will do anything just to make a buck. And 
the better technology got, the worse it got. But this was a very exclusive club. Back then, trading was very exclusive, and if you were not part of that club, well, well you don't trade. And you had to trade through these people called brokers. And the brokers, well, they are the next level of manipulation. Right? They're not interested in you making money, they're interested in making money themselves. You put in the order, they don't care whether or not you make money, they've locked in cash commissions. Right? So you're holding on to an unrealized profit or loss, and these guys are keep, just keep locking in cash commissions. Right? And um, in order to get into this exclusive club, you had to go through that channel. Well, nothing lasts forever, and the good times came to an end. One day you drive a Ferrari, the other next day you take a bus. So the game is fair. And uh, this is what we know as trading today. Everything's fully electronic and therefore fully manipulatable. You would think that with technology, things get better, things get easier. Well, with technology, things get harder. Sometimes, mm, call me a romantic, I like the good old days. We are just sit across the table from you and we agree on a price. Today, prices move faster than ever. Manipulation is even faster than that. One day you're doing very well and the next day you're down in the dumps. And look at all this technology. The technology has evolved into such a state that you don't even need a human to trade anymore. Today we have what we call algorithmic systems where computers are trading. Computers who have no idea about value, no idea about pricing, all they do is churn out numbers and automatically trigger buy and sell signals. So the market has introduced not only manipulation but irrationality into this business as well. But throughout all this, one thing remains constant. One thing remains very constant, in spite of the market being faster and more irrational and more manipulated. In spite of the way the market has evolved, the only constant is you, the human being. And this is the one thing we can control. We can't control the way the market works. We can't control how much the market wants to give us. But there are certain things that are within our control so that we can go into the market, take a trade, and be in absolute control of our situation. Trading as we know it has never changed. Like Jesse Livermore says, stock market never changes, Wall Street never changes, the pockets will change, the suckers will change, stocks will change, but by and large, Wall Street or the stock markets never change because humans by nature never change. And bearing that in mind, if you look back in Japan 400 years ago, that's how we did it. Then what we do today is no different from what we did in the past. It's just that we have technology which makes it more difficult. Okay, some of you may beg to differ. Some of you will say, well, Conrad, I don't totally agree with that. Within the period that I was writing this book, I interviewed a lot of old traders, veterans, guys who have been trading for 30 years. And these guys started their craft in a, bit, in a time where there was no electronics. They used to plot graph paper, use the old child style of charting called point and figure charting. They didn't have all these fancy electronics with MACDs and moving averages on them. And they still made money. When I interviewed these guys, I asked them all the same question. How is trading today compared to when you started, when you were a young trader? The answer is always the same. Trading today is easier, but making money back then was better. So even with technology, you would expect to be a better trader today. Not entirely true. And the reason for this is because so many elements have been introduced into the market. Elements that are beyond our control, like algorithmic systems, manipulation, big conglomerates who are always moving prices. So what's in it for us, the retail trader? Well, there is some good news. Trading as we know it today, as an online trader, most traders end up or start out being aggressive. They come into the market thinking that technology is on their side and they push the boundaries. They depend heavily on that technology. They are constantly seeking out buy and sell signals. 
therefore making them aggressive. And because they are aggressive, they are also sophisticated because they, of the equipment they use. They are hasty. The moment the computer tells them something, they jump on it. Not much in terms of analysis. They are unrealistic. Most of the time, these computer systems are telling you that you can make money based on what has happened. I'll say that again. The computer system tells you that you can make money based on what has already happened. Therefore, unrealistic. They are also very impatient. Sometimes they don't even wait for the computer to tell them what to do. They jump ahead of the computer, which is even worse. And obviously, they're very confused. The fact that they have a system to work with and they are jumping the gun and thinking that they're smarter than the computer, obviously they're confused. They don't trust the system completely. And all these things just help to make the market even more irrational. This is a huge part of the kind of market that we're in today. And a lot of times when we look at our charts and we're looking at prices, we ask those questions like, why is the market like that? Why is the market doing this? I thought, you know, because of the news or because of this particular situation, the market should be doing that, right? Just like yesterday, you know? Yesterday, market did something that I, I, I totally didn't expect, right? The day before, Janet Yellen threatened that she would raise interest rates. Usually, the market will have a little bit of a correction. Well, it corrected, right? She was talking for one hour, one full hour on Wednesday. And within that one hour, she only had to say three words. Three words. In six months. And the market went down, big time. And I thought the market would continue, you know, in a bearish situation yesterday, or even you know, in the worst case scenario, just stay flat. But the market rallied instead. And there was no explanation for it other than, you know, some some bullish news. But I saw more bearish news than bullish news. So how do you explain something like that? How do you explain something like that? And there are many, many sessions in the market that are like that, that can't be explained, and the more you rationalize it, the more irrational it sounds. So Blame this guy, the guy who overly depends on his technology. That's why the market behaves that way. One of the reasons why I think the market bounced yesterday was because on Wednesday when it sold off, it hit a critical level, right? Very critical support levels on the S&P and the Dow. And it generated all sorts of buy signals on the algorithmic systems as well as on this guy's computer. And so they bought, they bought in. In spite of the macroeconomics being bearish, in spite of what's happening in Crimea, and in, you know, we still can't find 239 people, the market rallied. How do you explain something like that? The reason why we are in this situation is because the world has gotten more sophisticated and, more, and, and smaller. Today, everyone who comes into this business has something to sell you. And with the internet, it's so easy to reach across the world and sell you these things. And everybody wants to sell you something that can sell. So they will hype up whatever they are selling. Words like get rich quick, financial freedom, millionaire. These are the words that reach out to you and make you feel as if you can be one of them. And it's only going to cost you $1.99. And everybody jumps on that. Everyone has something to sell. Everybody has a dream to sell. And it's only going to cost you $1.99. The way they sell it is so effective that we look past common sense. Somebody will come up to you and he will sell you a course or he will sell you a, a software or something that can make you a million dollars within one year. And he's selling it to you for $1.99. If I had something that could make you a million bucks in one year, I'd sell it to you for two million. If you had a software that could make somebody $10,000 a month, you probably sell that software to him for 20000 And Am I right? We live in a very realistic world. Yet, we still get conned into these things. We still get sold these things. We still get hyped up into all these sales programs because the name of the game is profit. Everyone has something to sell. Well, I'm guilty of it from time to time. But if you want to get rich quick, well, <laughs> that's the best way to get rich quick. You con people into buying something that's not worth it. That's why we have 80% of the market that are losers and less than 20% that are actually winners. The winners are a unique group of people who knows what it takes to become 
successful. Winning in the market is no different than winning in life. In life, success doesn't happen by chance, it doesn't happen by accident, it's not a gift, it's not an obligation, it's something that you have to work for. So the 20% or so who are sitting at the top there are people who know that it takes a lot of dedication to learn this craft, it takes even longer to understand its form, and it takes forever to learn how to apply it. Even till today, after well, nine years of online trading, I'm still a student, I'm still learning. I tell my students, don't call me guru, sifu, master or sir. My name is Conrad and I'm a trader and I'm still learning. And everybody continues learning. Anyone who says, I've learned it all and I know everything, well, good luck to you because you're about to fail. I always tell myself, the day I concede that I have arrived is the day I'm lost. And the day I think that I have succeeded is the day I failed. It's an ongoing learning process, whether in the markets or whether in life. Life is an ongoing journey of learning experiences. And that's what trading is about too. If you think you're trading well and there's nothing left for you to learn, good luck. The market's about to turn and you're going to get caught. The old school of thinking in this business is mind, money and method. Well, it's not a, it's not a system that I don't agree with, right? On the contrary, I think it works very well. Mind, money, and method. But there's something wrong with this system here. I used to apply this before. I would think that psychology is the most important thing, and once I have my psychology in place, then I will go and learn financial management. Once my psychology and financial management is in place, then I learn the methodology, I trade, I will be fine. Somehow it didn't work. The three M's, although new, modern, is old school. Let me show you older school. The three defensive approaches, which was discovered by Omar Mune Hisa 280 years ago. Some Western fella took the three defensive approaches and turned it into mind, money, method. But the original three M's were actually the three defensive approaches, risk management, financial management, and psychological management. In that order. First, you, know, you have to know what the risks are. You have to know where the risk is coming from. You have to plan against that risk. And once you are in a situation to accept that risk, then you know how much risk you're taking, then let's talk about your financial management. You know what the risk is, so you know how much finances to put on that risk. You don't want to put too much if the risk is too high. And if the risk is low, well, put more on. And you know there's risk, so if something does happen, you can manage it. And once all that is in place, then with a strategy, you go into the trade with the right kind of psychology. No point preparing all your psychology if you don't know how to budget yourself and don't know how, where the risk is coming from. All the best psychology in the world is not going to help you. But if you know what your budget is and if you know where the risk is coming from, it's much easier to handle your psychology. And this is actually detailed in my book. And it's very simple. It's a almost 300-year-old practice that has been going on in Japan, even in the business world in Japan. The books that were written by Homa Munehisa are selling very well, even till today, and it's used at a corporate level. That's Homa Munehisa. He was an honorary samurai and a legendary trader, just after the Tokugawa Wars and during the uh, Meiji era. And this guy wrote a series of books which till today are like Bibles in the business world. He wrote Sanen Kinsen uh, Hiroku, and then uh, Sakata, this is my favorite book, the Sakata Senjutsu Shokai. I have to pronounce it rightly, others, uh, my sensei will come and kill me. And of course, his last book, which is the, uh, the Soba Zen Mai Den. And these books are all about trading psychology. The Sakata book is all about everything that's in threes. And you will see that even today's short presentation, I'm using a lot of threes in my presentation. I even teach my students how to use threes in their trading techniques. What he taught us is nothing new. It's just that the West has taken what, what uh, he has written and turned it into something more, well, Western, right, which is more gung-ho. The Americans have a very different view of, of life. They're more, yee-haw, gung-ho, and you know, you thought, you know, the Chinese were bad with, you know, cheong ah, huat ah. That's nothing compared to the American gung-hoism, right? And, because of this, I found that it didn't 
work for me when I started trading. And uh, when I started teaching some of my friends who came to my house, I was using the same techniques and teaching them, and, and it didn't work for them. Within the, those techniques was one fundamental flaw. We are not gung-ho. As Asians, we are conservative. We are kiasu. Right? The American attitude is, kill or be killed. Excuse me, I do not want to be killed. I'm kiasi. <laughs> so I much prefer the Japanese way of doing things, which is, well, the classical way of doing things. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of feng shui, right? In feng shui, there are so many different schools. You have one school which sells you all these ornaments and crystals and stuff that you put around your house and you're supposed to change the energy flow. Well, that's very modern. The classical feng shui style of doing things didn't apply those things back in the days of the emperor. They use, uh, what do you call those things? Metaphysics, right? They use elemental metaphysics, where you're marrying things like earth, wind, fire, water, with metal and wood. And they use the surrounding. Take advantage of the surrounding to harness the, the, the good flow of qi. That's classical feng shui. Today, what we have as traders is a very modern way of doing things. Like I mentioned, everything's electronic. We depend very heavily on our technology. And for some reason, the more we depend on it, the worse it gets. So what have you got to lose? Turning your mind around and doing things the classical way. The way they used to do things in Japan three, four hundred years ago, because it still applies today. And I can you know, testify to the fact that it actually works. Because ever since I turned my trading around using the Japanese style of doing things, it really, really works. It's a very defensive approach. It's a very defensive approach. It's very conservative. I used to be a rifleman, and one of the things that I was trained was to aim small. When you aim small, you miss small. That's very conservative, which is why maybe some of you are losing big money huh, because you're aiming too big. So learn to aim small and miss small. The classical trader is a very defensive person. He defends what he has worked so hard to make, his capital. He doesn't want to give it away freely. We have the uh, Western style of doing things, then well, that money's going to flow out pretty fast. You'll be rich one day and poor the next day. He's also conventional. In other words, he uses a lot of common sense. He doesn't buy into the hype. He uses common sense and stays grounded. He's disciplined, obviously, doesn't believe in the hype. He's realistic, patient, and conservative. So you can see that the classical trader is very different from the modern trader today who's aggressive, impatient, confused, overly dependent on technology. And this is who I am today. I'm a very conservative trader, I'm a very defensive trader, so much so I hardly look at charts. My students will attest to that. They've seen me trade and I seldom look at charts. I look at charts before the fact and after the fact, but not while I'm trading. While I'm trading, I'm just looking at numbers, which is the old way of doing it. Some of you may have heard, you know, uh, uh, salesmen selling you software, and they will sell you the same line all the time. They will tell you, Wall Street uses this. Use this software, you don't need to work so hard. There are blue arrows and red arrows to tell you when to buy and sell. Watch for the blue line and the red line. Wall Street traders trade like that. Just let me break my presentation a bit and go back one slide, okay? And let me just show you the proof that these guys are blatant liars. Welcome back to Wall Street. Where are those charts? If Wall Street uses it, where are those charts? Somebody tell me where those charts are. You see what the traders are doing? They're trading by numbers, aren't they? And that's all they're looking at. Any charts you see are not like the kind of charts that you look at. They are called oscillators. They are oscillators. They don't look like stock charts, do they? And those are the kind of charts I look at. I look at oscillators. I don't bother with stock charts. I only look at stock charts before the fact and after the fact, but most of the time I'm doing what these guys are doing. We're staring at numbers. Take a look at the whole New York Stock Exchange. All the screens. How many charts do you see? Give you the close-up again. Where are the charts? Kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? 
And this is what we are sold. We buy books, we read the stuff, we come overly dependent on our charting, we attend workshops and the first thing the guru asks you to do is look at charts and everything is on your chart. And like I said just now, these guys are hoping to buy something that the chart tells them could make money based on something that has already happened. That's what charting is about. These guys don't trade by charts. They're looking at the numbers to tell them what is going to happen. The charts only tell you what has happened. So let's get back to my last slide. Where was my last slide? Okay, here we are. That's right, we finished Homo Munivisa. Alright, so who you are is how you trade because, well, there are many things you can't hide from the market. A lot of us have bad habits, and these are one of the things that actually affects our psychology as well. Some of us are procrastinators, some of us live in denial, some of us don't like to see the obvious truth. Yeah? And yeah, it's very obvious that some of us don't like to see the obvious truth. We'd rather buy the millionaire dream than to sign up for a course where the teacher tells you you're going to lose money. Well, I would sign up for a course that when the teacher tells me I can lose money. Because any teacher that tells me that knows how to lose smart. And these are the bad habits that will kill you all the time. You come into the market thinking, okay, I just follow a set of rules, I'll be fine. But you don't realize that who you are and your bad habits are going to betray you in the market. If some of you are procrastinators, it will show up in your trades. You'll be holding a whole portfolio of red positions, all losing money. And if somebody asks you, why are you still holding on to it? Oh, don't worry, they will come back. That's living in denial. When you're supposed to have cut a long time ago, you're still not cutting and you're holding on to it. Well, another reason for that is maybe you're living, you're procrastinating. Now, all these habits, impatience and stuff like that will affect us and the way we trade. It will affect our bottom line and the results that we get. So, in order to avoid things like that, well, you have to accept the fact that in order to be good at what you do in the market, you have to have the patience for it. You have to work at it. You have to, to practice like hell. Now, I like the word success, but if you ask me what success means, success means a lot of hard work. There are no free lunches in this business. Success belongs to those who work at it the hardest and believe in it the longest. Anything you build in haste never lasts. So it takes time to build up this experience. It takes time to build up that psychological strength. It's not a, something where you, if you just buy my book, you read it, oh, I'll be, good, I'll be better from now on, right? No. It still takes a lot of experience, yeah? So, in a market that is going to kill you, and in a market that's waiting to run you down, and in a market that's manipulated even by machines, not even by humans, how do you avoid all these pitfalls? Buy my book. <laughs> after four years of waiting and after much writing and research, I'm proud, very, very proud to reveal my biggest project ever in my life.